Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Recover Research Review or R3 seminar. My name is Sarah Hatcher and I am a research epidemiologist with the Recover Administrative Coordinating Center at RTI International and the moderator of today's seminar. The goal of this seminar series is to catalyze a shared understanding of the research within the Recover Consortium. Next slide. I want to start by thanking everyone who submitted questions in advance. The chat feature is disabled, so please submit any questions that arise during today's presentation using the Q&A feature in Zoom. After the presentation, we will answer as many questions as possible. Some questions may also be answered within the Q&A feature on Zoom. An FAQ document will be posted with the recording of the seminar on recovercovid.org. It will include answers for many of the questions we received today, including those who those we did not have time to address. Questions about other scientific topics will be addressed in future seminars and answers to broader questions about recover will be available in the FAQs at recovercovid.org. Next slide. Our presenters today are Dr. Melissa Hendel, Dr. Christopher Schutt, Dr. Thomas Carton, and Dr. Renu Kaushal. Dr. Melissa Hendel is the Chief Research Informatics Officer and Marsika Chair in Data Science at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus and Director of the Center for Data to Health. Her research has focused on integration of genotype and phenotype data to improve rare disease diagnosis and mechanism discovery. Dr. Hendel's vision is to weave together healthcare systems, basic science research, and patient-generated data through development of data integration technologies and innovative data capture strategies. Dr. Christopher Schutt completed his undergraduate and medical training at Brown University, internal medicine residency at Dartmouth, and doctoral training in epidemiology at Harvard. He is board certified in internal medicine and clinical informatics and a fellow of the American College of Physicians, the American College of Epidemiology, and the American College of Medical Informatics. Dr. Schutt's current research focuses on translating basic science information to clinical practice and on how we classify dysfunctional phenotypes or disease. Dr. Thomas Carton is the chief data officer for the Louisiana Public Health Institute principal investigator of the Research Action for Health Network and executive director of the Greater New Orleans Health Information Exchange. He has held multiple leadership positions within the National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network or PCORNET, including chair of the PCORNET Steering Committee. Dr. Carton's research projects leverage electronic health record, health information, health insurance claims, and community level and patient reported data across subject matter, including COVID-19, adult congenital heart disease, cardiovascular health, pregnancy health, and healthy aging. Dr. Renu Kaushal is the Senior Associate Dean for Clinical Research Chair of the Department of Population Health Sciences, Nanette Leitman Distinguished Professor at Whale Cornell Medicine, and the Physician-in-Chief of Population Health Sciences at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Whale, Whale Cornell Medical Center. Dr. Koshal leads Whale Cornell Medicine's clinical research enterprise, bridging, bridging cutting-edge science with patient care, including ongoing scientific studies surrounding COVID-19. Dr. Koshal has authored over 200 scientific publications and is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Josh Fessel and Dr. Rachel Hess will serve as our discussants today. Dr. Josh Fessel is the Senior Clinical Advisor in the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, Division of Clinical Innovation, where he serves as a liaison between basic and clinical scientists and helps build bridges between multiple stakeholders to ensure that the most innovative clinical science moves forward. 
before joining NCATS in December 2021. He was a medical officer at the National Heart, Blood, Lung, and Blood Institute, and Dr. Fessel took on additional roles in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including participating in the active public-private partnership and helping lead several efforts across NIH to address the post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Dr. Rachel Hess is a professor of population health sciences and internal medicine, the founding chief of the Division of Health System Innovation and Research, and the associate dean for clinical and translational science at the University of Utah Schools of the Health Sciences. She serves as the contact PI of the, of the Utah Center for Clinical and Translational Science and, as, and is the University of Utah lead for the Greater Plains Collaborative in the Picornet Clinical Research Networks. Dr. Hess's research aim, aims to improve patient-centered outcomes in clinical care, and her implementation work uses health information technology to engage patients in their care. Next slide. The topic of today's seminar is leveraging electronic health records and real-world data to understand post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection, or PASC. With that, I will hand it over to Dr. Fessel. Thank you so much, Dr. Hatcher. I'm going to um, keep this introduction very pithy and short. Um, we could have a lot more time to, to do prelude if we weren't uh, graced with such impressive people to hear from today. And you didn't sign up to hear from me, you signed up to hear from them. Just to give you a little bit of context for why there is an electronic health record and real world data component to the Recover initiative in the first place. Um, we knew when we were um, conceiving of what recover uh, might look like and what it needed to do. And this was really even before we knew it was going to be called recover. But in thinking about how to address past or long COVID, it was really clear from the earliest uh, time points that this was something that was really uh, being understood as an outgrowth of what people were experiencing as they survived acute COVID-19 and then went on to um, to recognize and, and report that things were not back to normal yet. And we understood pretty early on that this was going to be a, a, a wide um, spectrum of issues that all needed to be thought about um, together as much as possible to, to understand what's going on, what what why are people experiencing this, who is at risk to experience this, how do we help better. And the place uh, or one of the places where those pieces of information all kind of come together um, is in uh, electronic health records and in real world data where, where people are, are seeking out uh, care from their trusted healthcare teams. And we were lucky enough to know and to, or to come to recognize that, that there were uh, several teams already in motion um, that had at their disposal um, not only secure uh, private data assets that um, protected people's health information but still allowed conclusions to be drawn, but they also had the multidisciplinary teams um, already around the right, at the time, virtual tables to, um, to really think about this from lots of different angles and to get moving uh, as quickly as they could. And I think that's probably enough preamble for why we have uh, a, an electronic health record component to recover. And I, I think the excitement is going to come from hearing from those teams. Uh, and that's what we're here to do today. And so I, I want to thank all of them for being here. Thank everyone who's uh, signed on to, to the seminar today. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to our first presenters, which I believe are our PCORNET presenters to talk about um, clinical phenotypes uh, and subphenotypes, and, and we'll roll on from there. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Josh. Um, this is Renu Kaushal. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, and I will be presenting the first half of this, and then my um, close colleague and multi-PI, uh, Tom Carton, will be presenting the second half. Um, next slide. Both Tom and I are founding PIs of an entity called PCORNET, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Network. It was funded and established by PCORI in 2014. 
It currently consists of over 65 sites with um, uh, about 80 million lives. And within Picornet, there are 41 sites that are enriching their data for recover. You, you will know that there are a number of pediatric sites in here and we're, we're really um, happy and um, uh, that the, the pediatric consortium was also funded to help drive important discoveries in that population um, they presented at the last uh, seminar series. <clears throat> Across these sites, we have over 15 billion rows of data this includes structured EHR information. We're in the midst of collecting unstructured EHR inf information. We have links to public payer data, links to exposome data, including race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, environmental, and so on. We have about 145 different exposome variables that we're linking to. And links to vaccine data, which I think will become increasingly important as, um, as even this hour unfolds. Um, next slide. The arc of the three data um, uh, um, grantees is to detect, predict, treat, and prevent, to drive EHR-based discoveries in detection, prediction, treatment, and prevention of PASC um, over this first 12 months. We have primarily focused on um, phenotypic development um, in order to enable characterization of PASC, to iteratively quantify incidence and prevalence, to start exploring temporal trends. And in addition, we've done important work in the epidemiology of PASC is already described, but also in terms of disparities. Um, both race and racial and ethnic disparities, as well as socioeconomic disparities. I will be presenting mainly on our machine learning and artificial intelligence work. Um, this, is, uh, this work has been led by Fei Wang at Wall Cornell Medicine. Um, Tom Carton will be primarily presenting on the epidemiology and health services research and adding in a discussion of queries. Just a, a brief aside about queries. Um, queries are our opportunity on behalf of the entire Recover Network to query, to do a simple analytical look at our overall data set. And queries are important because they allow us to uh, understand trends. Um, and they allow us to help with hypothesis generation, including understanding a potential um, uh, you know, pool of participants in a, a cohort of participants in a clinical trial and, and so on. Um, next slide. With that, I am going to dive pretty deeply for the next 10 minutes into the development of computable phenotypes. Um, and I think what I should start with is that PASC is it, it has been clear to us from the outset, particularly because many of us are clinicians, that PASC is a very varied disease, right? Like it, it sort of affects many different systems. There are obviously different types of clusters that are occurring of, of symptoms and conditions. And so what we hoped to do was to harness the power of machine learning and AI to really help us first to robustly understand computable phenotypes, and then to um, start sub phenotyping through something that's often called patient similarity analytics, where we start looking at cohorts of patients that are quite similar. Next slide. So for our computable phenotyping, we used a data-driven high throughput analysis. Um, this uh, manuscript, the preprint has been published on MedArchive and it's under review. And what we did in this piece is we characterized PASC through increased burden of new EHR diagnoses and medications in SARS-CoV-2 patients compared with controls. And let me, let me 
break out a couple of those things because I think that it's uh, understanding the the methodological approach is is I think very very important. The first is is that we looked at SARS-CoV-2 patients who had either PCR or antigen laboratory test positivity. Um, that felt important to us to do it in that way, even though it decreased our sample size, because we knew that with some certainty that those patients had an acute SARS-CoV-2 infection. The second thing is, is that the way we chose to do this was we looked at incident diagnoses and medications in the post-acute COVID period. So we looked at the 31 to 180 days post-COVID, and we looked at conditions that were brand new. So for example, if a patient had existing asthma and they had an asthma code in the post-acute phase, they would not be included in this. We did this again to be as pure as possible. We wanted to really understand what were likely conditions to be associated with COVID. And then we compared these incident diagnoses and medications in our SARS-CoV-2 patients compared with controls. We studied over 57,000 SARS-CoV-2 patients, 500,000 controls, our data set was derived from 14 million people in the greater New York City area and 17 million people in Florida. Um, the, the fact that we did two geographical areas becomes important in a second. And the way in which we identified putative PASC diagnoses and medications was based on literature review and expert clinical consultation. So there's been a, about a hundred studies published on PASC. We reviewed every single one of them to um, uh, derive um, diagnoses lists and medications um, that have been used to treat PASCs. And then, um, as I mentioned, we have about you know, 40 or so clinicians representing a multitude of different specialties. And so we relied very heavy, heavily on expert clinical consultation to come up with this 137 putative diagnoses and a 459 putative medications. We ended up identifying significantly higher incidence of conditions in 10 systems. They're listed here. I, I don't think that will be surprising to anyone. Um, uh, respiratory, circulatory, musculoskeletal and connective tissue, neurologic disorders such as brain fog, psychiatric disorders, particularly anxiety, gastrointestinal disorders. This becomes very interesting when we get into our subphenotypes. There was a very nice piece published in uh, Cell Medicine um, sometime this week, it may have been yesterday, which demonstrated that uh, patients with acute COVID infections continue to shed virus in fecal matter for up to four months. Endocrine, metabolic, blood, genitourinary. What was very interesting, and I won't dive deep into this um, because I, 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 want to, I want to cover too much in my allotted time, um, but happy at, at a later point to, to, to describe this in more detail, was that there was higher burden of PASC in New York City compared with Florida. Uh, we think that that geographic variation is likely tied to the fact that in New York City, we had the original variant. We were the, you know, the epicenter of the pandemic um, worldwide, but uh, also very much so in the U.S. And um, uh, and um, uh, the treatment modalities weren't yet sophisticated. Like even the use of steroids to treat pass uh, to treat acute COVID disease was was not well established until. Um, after that an original um, uh, onslaught here in New York City. Uh, and, and we think that there is some links to variants. Next slide. So this, these are incident hazard ratios. The salmon colored are New York City um, uh, um, risk of these conditions. The purple ones are one Florida's. Um, and as you can see, there are several different 
organ systems represented, as I mentioned in my, my, my first slide, um, and that there's a higher burden in um, uh, uh, the New York City market compared to the one Florida market. Next slide. Um, this slide, uh, we um, looked at uh, cumulative incidents um, and we broke out our outpatients versus inpatients for their acute illness. We broke out patients in terms of age and we broke out patients in terms of gender. The graph on the right shows from zero to 100 in terms of incidence rate, uh, density of disease. And what you see here is that people who were hospitalized for their initial COVID infection, older patients and males had higher burden of uh, post-acute incident symptomatology uh, and conditions. Next slide. Now I'm going to go into subphenotyping. So here again, we relied on advanced um, machine learning and AI um, methodological approaches. Uh, Faye actually holds the first patent in healthcare for patient similarity analytics. And the way in which he approached this work is by using what is called topic modeling. And so what we did is we took the 137 newly incident diagnoses that we found through our phenotyping work and we categorized them um, into 10 topics based on co-occurrence patterns across over 34,000 patients. We then analyzed the clustering of the topics in these patients to demonstrate four sub-phenotypes. These sub-phenotypes become really, really important because for clinicians and for researchers, if you can understand how patients cluster, you can help them both in terms of defining treatment, but also in terms of prognostication. So the four subphenotypes were characterized first by cardiac and renal disorders. These were older patients. This had the greatest proportion of males and had the highest severity in the acute phase. The second um, phenotype was respiratory conditions, including sleep disorders, and anxiety. These were the youngest patients, the highest rate of females, and the lowest rates of initial hospitalization. The third was musculoskeletal and nervous system conditions. Here the, in the middle for age and, and gender distribution. And the last, very consistent with what we're starting to see in the literature, was digestive system accompanied by some respiratory conditions. Um, the next four slides are, are circus plots. Um, you can keep going. Uh, what this plot shows on the, 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 the left is the relative incidence of each of the conditions and the past conditions in the first subphenotype, cardiac, the dysrhythmia as heart failure, renal failure, things that we see associated with renal failure, such as electrolyte disorders and anemia, malaise, fatigue, and sleep disorders. Next slide, subphenotype two was um, the mildest of, of the four um, uh, characterized by breathing abnormalities or pain, nonspecific chest pain, anxiety disorders, and headaches. I say the mildest because it seems like even in the time period that we are observing these patients that their symptoms are starting to resolve. Next slide. Subphenotype three, musculoskeletal pain, connective tissue disease, osteoarthritis, um, brain fog. What is very interesting is that patients in this subphenotype have the highest incidence of comorbidities that are related to, to musculoskeletal and nervous system issues. Next slide. Um, and then this is a, the digestive system one. A lot of different types of gastrointestinal disorders, some pelvic disorders as well, rest, and accompanying respiratory issues, a little bit of chest pain or cardiac dysrhythmias. Um, next slide. I'm going to end here. Um, I have 
Um, just uh, two main points. The first is PASC is very clinically diverse. There is so much for us to still learn about this set of, of symptoms and conditions. Um, I think that the electronic health record is very rich, particularly in terms of symptoms, and will be a good source to enable us to continue to characterize this, ideally with patient input through surveys and other modalities. Um, I already mentioned the geographic variation. And then I would end with the fact that um, our work is indicating that there's four subphenotypes. Um, they, they vary based on demographic characteristics, severity of initial disease, and pre-existing comorbidities, particularly for the musculoskeletal type. But for example, for cardiac and renal, these patients had existing heart failure and renal dysfunction. Um, sorry for that typo with dysfunction. And, and for respiratory system, pre-existing breathing abnormalities and so on. So um, let me end there and turn it over to uh, my colleague, uh, Melissa. It's great to be here today to present on behalf um, of the National COVID Cohort Collaborative or N3C's participation in the RECOVER program. So I wanted to just give a quick overview of what we've been doing in the N3C. Um, the N3C was launched at the beginning of the pandemic in order to collate um, the nation's um, electronic health record to better understand uh, the new disease that is COVID and now um, PASC. Um, we now have 73 different institutions who have contributed data uh, with 13.5 million um, patient records uh, in our secure enclave. Um, the uh, Cohort is representative of the United States in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, geography, socioeconomic status, and health background. And one of the really special things about the N3C is it's really the first publicly available national harmonized um, limited data set um, in which we can um, really overcome the source data heterogeneity. And you can see on the lower half of this slide that we collect data from um, uh, multiple different common data models such as OMOP, ACT, Trinetics, and BCORNET, as well as other um, data models. And our pipeline harmonizes all of these different data from different institutions um, into one uh, patient level repository where we can perform some of the kinds of analytics that are not possible uh, in a distributed context, which is really important uh, in the face of this new disease. We now have 455 organizations uh, participating in the use of these data with uh, over almost uh, 4,000 users. And so it's quite the exercise in, in team science and also in making um, real world data uh, fundamentally um, rigorous, computable and interoperable um, at a scale that's unprecedented. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, work that's been led uh, by Dr. Emily Pfaff and Andrew Gerben. Um, and this is the development of a machine learning approach to phenotyping uh, uh, for PASC patients, essentially um, coming up with in the face of not having a clinical gold standard for defining PASC, coming up with a variety of different approaches in order to define who may actually have PASC in the absence of a code for U09.9, which is the new code that has been um, uh, made available in October of last year. And so what this method um, leveraged was essentially we coded patients that had been seen at a long COVID clinic um, and based on a variety of different um, sort of inclusion and exclusion criteria in terms of the temporality of those patients, we're able to develop um, a machine learning approach that would uh, identify those patients based upon a training set from those long COVID clinics or from patients with the U09.9 code. As we have um, uh, advanced since the launch of that U09.9 code, we have been refining this computable phenotype to identify um, uh, co long COVID patients. Um, and uh, the more that the U09.9 code is, is utilized, um, uh, the more we can actually uh, try a number of different approaches for validation. Basically, what the method does is it learns patterns of the clinical features of PASC, such as dysapnea, fatigue, not having a vaccination, a new albuterol prescription, many outpatient visits, um, new cortical storage, 
corticosteroid uh, prescriptions. And this allows the machine learning um, PASC phenotype to identify previously unknown cases using these learned patterns. Um, the algorithm can be used today to identify cohorts for study recruitment and treatment considerations nationwide using your electronic health record uh, data uh, well beyond the National COVID Cohort Collaborative. And so we believe in the absence of a clinical gold standard that um, it is critically important to have a mechanism to identify potential uh, long COVID patients for, for, for these purposes. And I'd also like to point out that this, has, this work was the first Recover manuscript and has recently uh, finally released uh, in Lancet Digital Health and the link is there at the bottom. So um, what did we learn from this definition? Um, this uh, machine learning phenotype allows for sensitivity analyses to determine which factors are most important in predicting when someone has PASC. And so you can see um, that we looked at both uh, qualifying non-hospitalized patients as well as hospitalized patients. And then we have a model that leverages all patients together. Um, outpatient utilization is a key factor in defining um, uh, uh, whether or not somebody may have PASC. Um, and then we also saw that vaccination is associated with a lower um, uh, risk of being identified as potentially having PASC. Um, and you can see a variety of other features um, such as um, uh, sex, um, you know, um, drugs, a variety of different um, uh, diagnoses for metabolic diseases and vitamin D deficiencies that were all predictive when we um, trained the model in order to identify those, those patients. Using this, this method, we were able to identify 138,000 adult um, long COVID patients in the N3C, which is approximately 8% of all of our COVID patients with high confidence that would be eligible for, for the recover uh, research studies. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the more about the U09.9 code and its use in our phenotyping algorithm to identify PASC patients. Um, there is another code B94.8, uh, which is um, basically other specified infectious and parasitic diseases, which is used often as a proxy um, before the U09.9 code was made available. What's really interesting though, is we've been looking across our 73 sites that are in our release data set and only 36 at this time after six months um, are actually utilizing the U09.9 code, which really speaks to the sort of um, slow adoption of new codes. So there was a question from the audience in advance about the adoption of, of this code and, and how could we get codes faster? And I guess the point here at one point here is just that um, even when we do have codes, it doesn't mean that they're in, in, in common use. And then we've also been doing a fair amount of work to characterize their adoption at each individual site, which is actually um, uh, uh, quite variable. And you can see on a summary of those results over there on the right, where we see the um, adoption of the code uh, U09.9 um, long COVID code in blue and the more generalized B94.8 code in orange. And what's interesting is that even though the use of the U09.9 code has um, had, had significant uptake, that people are still using the B94.8 code, even in some patients that may have both codes. Um, and so it's, um, and then also you'll notice that there's U09.9 um, codes applied before they were actually released in October. And so these are retrospective um, uh, codings that uh, where uh, institutions have gone back and entered those codes um, after the fact. And so these are all things that need to be taken into account um, in the context of our um, uh, of our evaluations. The other thing I wanted to mention briefly as it was another question that was brought up um, uh, in advance was how do we address biases um, given the fact that not everyone is using U09.9, not everyone has a COVID positive test or a COVID diagnosis. Um, how are we ensuring that we are including um, long COVID patients that may not have any of these things in our analyses? And so I just wanted to reassure our patient community that we are doing everything we can um, in working with the patient-led research consortium to define strategies and methods that help us um, include long COVID patients that may not have uh, those original diagnoses. Um, and this includes 
um, comparing hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients, not requiring those positive tests for some of our analyses, but making sure that we take that um, information into account. And then just uh, in general, making sure that we include patients in all of our work in directing our and evaluating our analytics. So I wanted to move on to how do we, now that we have this um, you know, effective computable phenotype using this machine learning algorithm, we can identify those putative past patients. We can now actually perform a variety of different clustering approaches to identify past subtypes. Um, and just shown on the right here are just some of the subtypes um, that we've seen in a variety of different methods. And I'm gonna present two of the methods that we've been using today. Um, there's a neurological category, a metabolic or obesity related category, and a cardiopulmonary category. And I, I wanna impress upon everyone that these are not extraordinarily distinct categories, and I'll show an example of that, but, but are in fact um, a mechanism by which we may wish to consider these subtypes in the context of who gets different types of workups uh, within our recover um, of recruitment and, and study protocols, um, as well as our understanding of underlying mechanisms for the um, uh, outcomes that we see in these different categories. So, you know, fundamentally, we need to figure out how similar are two patients um, as, a pre as a precursor for understanding what subtypes of PASC may exist. So this is just an example. Um, our target data model is the OMOP data model. So the OMOP concepts are things like respiratory finding. I mean, we want to understand is if a patient has a, has a code for respiratory finding or acute kidney injury, how similar is that to another patient that may have a code for cough or transient renal failure? Whereas other types of, um, uh, um, other types of features may be an identical match such as chilblains uh, shown at the bottom. And this type of clustering, uh, addressing this type of clustering approach is led by um, Justin Reese, Peter Robinson and Sharice Madlock Brown. Um, and so I wanted to kind of, this is a pretty novel approach. So I wanted to give a quick overview. Um, here we have uh, um, a subgraph of the human phenotype ontology, which is a um, uh, owl-based um, computational resource that we use a lot in the, in the uh, clinical genetics uh, context, where we can um, robustly describe phenotypic features represented in a graph representing those features as a graph rather than as a simpler taxonomy as you might see in ICD um, provisions additional algorithms that we can use for, for understanding that patient similarity that I showed on the prior slide. So this shows two sets of patients, um, one that are similar to each other, two, two patients that are similar to each other and two that are not just to kind of show you what that looks like. And so we take all of that um, OMOP data that we have from our um, harmonized electronic health record data in the N3C enclave, and we transform it um, to the human phenotype ontology based upon a robustly provenant set of mappings um, that's let, been led by Tiffany Callahan. And in this case, you can see on the left, there are two patients that have um, very similar features. Some of them are identical, such as headache and depression. Some of them are similar, such as visual hallucinations and auditory hallucinations. And using that graph structure, the parent term hallucinations, we can know that they are um, those two terms are quite similar. On the right, we see two patients who are not so similar. So we may have things like um, uh, dyspnea and hypox hypoxia hypoxemia that are abnormalities of the respiratory system physiology, um, uh, but also related, uh, we also have an exact match to dysapnea. And so you can kind of see how the graph works here. Similarly, we have things like brachycardia, um, which is similar to tachycardia and palpitations with the um, kind of superclass uh, arrhythmia um, from the human phenotype ontology. But then we also have terms like dermatographic urticaria, which has no match uh, to patient number three. And so this would be a set of patients that have less similarity. So basically what we did was we took all of, for this particular experiment that I'm about to show you next, we took all of the patients um, with their human phenotype ontology codes and made a giant patient by patient similarity metrics and then applied um, some clustering algorithms using the graph matching algorithm to uh, understand what clusters may exist. And this is the result of that work. Um, our, we, we um, when after optimizing that clustering algorithm came up with six clusters 
they are um, uh, overlapping in some of their features and you can kind of see some of that overlap in the colors represented here. And as I mentioned earlier, that's not to say that they still aren't uh, potentially good targets for um, sub phenotypes used for um, subclinical workups uh, in the interventional trials or other mechanistic characterization. Cluster one is sort of our severe category and is varied and has phenotypic features in pretty much all categories. Cluster number two has a lot of pain and pulmonary features. Cluster number three has a lot of pain and neuropsychiatric features. Um, uh, cluster number four has a lot of enteric features and actually looks quite different. Um, cluster number five also has pain, but has cardiovascular features. And then cluster number six is also um, quite severe in, in a lot of other categories, in a lot of the categories. And so this just gives you a sense of what the outcome is. And we've done a lot more um, characterization of each of these um, in a manuscript that was just uh, submitted for preprint uh, today. So I wanted to move on to a different approach. So this is a topic modeling approach. And what topic modeling does is it looks at the labels of the various kinds of observations, diagnoses, and treatments to look to see um, what sort of what is enriched in different in different groupings of patients. And so um, just shown here is a snippet of approximately um, uh, 60 different um, topic categories. And this is work that's been led by Sean O'Neill. And in this case, you can kind of just see some examples like here in the middle, we have uh, disorders of the digestive system, um, you know, uh, disorder of the intestine, gallstones, things that are sort of um, gastrointestinal. Um, so uh, in this, in this uh, context, we can visualize these topics of relevance that um, based upon their probability of a patient being in one of those topics, the larger the text, the, the higher the probability that a patient is in that um, category. Um, and then we can look to see how do patients fit into these different categories across all of our different sites. And so shown on the, on the left is a set of pre-COVID primary topics and post-acute topics. And we're really interested in understanding the longitudinal trajectories of these patients as they move from one topic um, prior to COVID, during the acute phase, and in multiple phases post-COVID. And so this diagram just kind of shows how patients have a tendency to move from, from one um, topic category to another. And so what we're really trying to do is build a foundation on which we can do longitudinal subtyping. Um, and this is again, an example of um, how we're approaching that from a, uh, from a longitudinal perspective. Um, on the right, we see um, patients uh, kind of usage of each topic category. Again, approximately 60 categories were identified, although the exact number is, is not particularly important. Um, and you can see how um, pre-COVID patients um, usage uh, you know, changes in the different, um, if you go top to bottom, um, from pre-COVID to the, through the different post-acute um, phases, post-acute, and then during the acute phase. And so again, we're just trying to garner an understanding of how patients um, are characterized in terms of their topics as they move through the progression. Important to this work is to understand site level data heterogeneity and, and quality assurance and understanding sort of where some of the outliers are. And you can see on the left, um, we have pretty good systematic um, use across our data partners on the bottom, but we do see some outliers. And so those are things to either look at in terms of the clustering or um, in terms of the way in which the sites are coding their data. And I will stop there. And I think it's time for our discussion. Okay, I think I am up next. I just want to thank um, both Dr. Kaushal and Dr. Handel for um, really wonderful overviews of, of the work that both um, Pocornet and N3C are doing um, in this space. Um, I just briefly want to note that I'm one of the um, uh, PIs of the hub, of one of the hubs of the Recover um, cohort study, as well as um, participating in the Recover EHR study. And, and I came to this um, as a women's health um, physician who has really seen um, these types of related diagnoses being um, not well understood in, in many, many of my female patients. And I'm excited to be seeing the attention paid to these post-infectious um, syndromes now. Um, 
that 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 both presentations did a really great um, job, really trying to describe how our electronic health record data can um, help regarding underdiagnosis and misdiagnosis, and specifically the inappropriate attribution of symptoms. Um, as Dr. Handel noted, we're able within the electronic health record data to see clusters of symptoms um, that are identified within people diagnosed with the long COVID codes, and then see whether or not similar clusters of symptoms are seen within patients who have had COVID, but may not have had that code applied to them. And that kind of surveillance allows us to understand um, within these large EHR data sets, um, whether we are seeing a systematic underdiagnosing or misdiagnosing or misattribution of problems for these symptom clusters to other conditions, whether they be um, psychiatric, psychosomatic, or other areas. Um, and the, the wealth of the data in the, in the EHRs makes those patterns of symptoms possible. Um, the large data also really allows more rapid identification of phenotypes, which then can be further explored in more detail in other studies. These data can really be hypothesis generating. They can help us ask the right questions within our cohorts. They can help us ask the right questions within our intervention studies to help us understand how to begin to answer and disentangle the basis of PASC. How, why do some people go from COVID to this long COVID phenotype? And how can we begin to understand how to treat this so that, um, that we do not have this number of people suffering for years, decades, et cetera. Um, they do have some limitations, however, and I think that these were touched on briefly. Um, they're limited to people who do and are able to seek healthcare specifically at participating institutions. Those institutions may have more sophisticated electronic health record data. They also have enough staff to be able to package and send their electronic health record data in ways that are digestible by these formats. That may exacerbate some of our health inequities, both teams work very hard and diligently to have broad representation of different types of patients across the entire country being seen in different health systems. But we are still limited to those systems that have capacity to participate and have excess capacity, one might say, within their um, infrastructures to be able to do this. But, and while these groups are not linked to specific insurers, there are differences in how, how frequently and where different, differently insured patients are seen. Um, we may have seen that a little bit within our Florida versus New York data. We may have also seen that a little bit in the, in the data that Dr. Kalsha was presenting regarding the different um, levels of, of symptoms seen in those areas. There's also limitations regarding the documentation of a COVID diagnosis. While these codes are not limited to people who have a documented history of COVID, as testing moves from home, excuse me, moves to the home and away from medical centers, do we miss more people who have a history of COVID but do not have PASC? So those who do not, who got over their COVID pretty quickly and pretty easily and may have done a rapid at home, or I've been to New York, may have just tested on the streets of New York, and we may not know all of their, all of those, those individuals. So are we seeing some bias there? Um, so I, I think that these data are huge. They're hugely important. I know that I'm running out of time, but contextually, I like to think of the EHR data as our rapid monitoring and our broad strokes. If you're thinking about how we, manage, we monitor COVID activity within a community, we can think about wastewater surveillance as sort of understanding 
where things are in a general population. And our EHR data help us with that. They help us understand where to target, what to target, how to target. We then can move to more specific testing in people or our cohort studies like the Recover Cohort Initiative. So the Recover EHR data very much takes us in a big picture. The Recover Cohort Initiatives allow us to dive a little bit deeper into the specifics of a single patient. And then our clinical evaluations, which do feed into our EHR data, really are akin in some ways to our hopefully emerging quickly randomized controlled trials to be thinking about um, the treatment. And that bundle together becomes the Recover Initiative that we are really trying to understand the broad population of PASC, the details of why PASC, and then the hows of treating PASC. With that, I'm turning it over to Q&A. Sarah, you're muted. It happens once a day. Um, so I'll start us off with a question we received in advance of the seminar. Um, what does the EHR data indicate is being used to treat long COVID most frequently? And are these good candidates for randomized control trials? So I have a slide in, in uh, the epidemiology section that will partly address that and we'll do so at that time. Yeah, I think that question might be good to wait until we've, because I know both groups have content on that question um, in their separate Great. set of presentations. We actually don't have that content in our um, second presentation, but uh, do have it in our preprint that's on MedArchive and happy to dive deeper into any of this with any of the clinical cohorts. Great. Thank you all. We'll. Um... If that question is not addressed in the next session, we'll bring it up during that Q&A. Um, I think a follow on to the discussion about limitations, um, we have a question about how well Recover and other EHR based studies cover PASC outcomes in underserved and poorly surveilled communities like rural areas. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. And I, I think Rachel was touching upon this as well. Um, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of PCORNET, but I, I suspect that um, uh, Melissa will say similar things for, for N3C, which is that PCORNET has made an intentional effort to include networks uh, and consortia that um, treat underserved um, communities. Uh, in addition, in PCORNET, we are actively linking to um, public payer data, including Medicaid data. Um, but I, I think that part of why we see, for example, the higher burden of disease in New York City compared to Florida, the higher burden of PASC in New York City compared to Florida, in addition to the severity of the initial infection and so on, is, is an access issue. Um, and I think it's something we have to be very, very cognizant of and um, to dive deeply into and to try to characterize in certain communities. Um, Tom, you're, you're part of the Louisiana Public Health Institute. I don't know if you wanna expand on my answer. I'll, I'll add um, briefly, we, we have um, some that we'll present in the, in the epi section and, and I'll dr draw a little bit on Rachel's comment about various types of insured populations presence in the Cornet common data model. Um, while we have a lot of um, academic medical centers that are the um, backbone of, of Cornet, there are a good number of community-based hospital systems as well. Um, I can think of Ochin and, and Baylor Scott and White as a couple of, of, of examples. Um, so we, we do um, have those patient populations represented. And then to Rachel's point about the, the size of the data and the ability of things that you can do with the size is be able to do subgroup analyses, both regionally and by uh, socioeconomic um, and race and ethnic um, disparities, and some of which, which we'll show soon. And if I can just add something, I know I'm in Utah, which we, we like to call a rural and frontier state, and both the University of Utah and Intermountain Healthcare 
um, which provide, which between the two of them provide care to about 90, 80 to 90 percent of all Utahns um, and cover um, our entire state, including rural and frontier populations. And those data um, are included um, within the some at uh, uh, University of Utah within N3C and both University of Utah and Intermountain within Pocornet. So for those of our, our states that, that do serve more broadly, um, we move into our Idaho, um, our Idaho, Montana, um, and, and rural South Dakota communities as well. Um, I, I think that, that those, there are pockets, um, but Again, I think as Tom is noting, the data are so large that, that those differences are able to be seen, but we do have better coverage, I, I think as the, the questioner was alluding to within um, larger cities um, and larger population centers. Thanks so everyone. Should I just, I just like to add one additional comment. So just um, I agree with Dr. Hess, you know, I, we've, we've really worked very, very hard to include um, rural organizations and safety net hospitals um, uh, and public institutions that serve underserved communities. So it's actually, and we've done quite a lot of analysis to look at the representation of the various kinds of demographics to ensure that it is as representative as possible. The other thing I will say though, is that, you know, one of the, uh, one of the biggest challenges and that um, I think is something that we all need to think more carefully about uh, in the recover program is the way in which we code those, that information in the electronic health record so that we can actually um, do a better job of understanding the influences of environmental health, of um, social um, determinants of health um, in the context of the clinical outcomes. And so we've been working very closely with uh, a number of sites to try to do that better and also performing analytics to kind of understand how do we actually improve some of that um, coding. And so, you know, things like um, record codes and other measures of, you know, access um, have been integrated into the N3Cs so that we can do that kind of multimodal uh, analytics with those kinds of um, data assets at the same time uh, in combination with the clinical data. Thanks everyone. Uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to the next session of the presentation. I'm gonna continue the uh, presentation that Renu started, focus on the epidemiology, health services research to answer vital population health questions of PASC, then make a quick final overview of queries and connections with the clinical cohorts. Next slide, please. I'll begin by discussing two recent publications, the first on prevalence of new PASC symptoms and conditions among adults and children in the 30 to 150 days after a positive SARS-CoV-2 test, and the second assessing cardiac complications among patients following a SARS-CoV-2 infection versus an mRNA vaccine. These represent collaborative work across the PCORNET EHR and CDC PCORNET COVID response teams. Next slide. For PASC symptoms and conditions, the objective was to compare prevalence of new and select symptoms and conditions after 31 to 150 days among test persons testing a positive versus negative for SARS-CoV-2. We conducted this within 40 health systems across the uh, PCORNET network. We looked at roughly 170,000 COVID positive adults between March and December of 2020. We required that patients had a medical encounter both in the pre-index period, seven days to 18 months before the COVID infection, and 31 to 150 days after the index. We excluded patients with record of symptom or condition in the baseline pre-index period, similar to what Renu described earlier. So we're capturing incident conditions and symptoms. We split the patients into age-based cohorts, divided them into COVID positive and negative groups with a corresponding a PCR or antigen test. We calculated pre prevalence ratios of SARS-CoV-2 positive versus SARS-CoV-2 negative patients. And we found that patients hospitalized after a SARS-CoV positive SARS-CoV-2 test 
had higher rates of diagnosis of certain symptoms and conditions compared to negative patients. Next slide, please. This slide displays the uh, prevalence ratios of COVID positive versus COVID negative adults age 18 and over, further segmented by severity, non-hospitalized, hospitalized, and hospitalized with mechanical ventilation. For symptoms, fatigue and shortness of breath were most prevalent among hospitalized and mechanical vented patients. Heart rate abnormalities, cognitive dysfunction, and sleep disorders were more prevalent amongst hospitalized patients only. For conditions, myoneural disorders, type 2 diabetes, ataxia, and peripheral nerve disorders were more prevalent amongst mechanical vented patients, while myoneural disorders and type 2 diabetes were more prevalent amongst hospitalized patients as well. Next slide, please. For cardiac complications, the objective was to calculate incidence of cardiac outcomes, three of them, myocarditis alone, myocarditis or pericarditis, and a combo of myocarditis, pericarditis, or MISC after SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. We assessed myocarditis and myocarditis or pericarditis after SARS-CoV-2 infection and vaccination. We further assessed these diagnoses with MISC after infection only. We calculated seven, 21, and 42-day incident risk ratios, um, um, complications um, compared of, of infection compared to vaccination. We looked at one, two or unspecified or any dose of vaccine. And we calculated the incidence of myocarditis after infection divided by the incidence of myocarditis after vaccination with an mRNA vaccine. We did the same for myocarditis and pericarditis, the second outcome. And for the third and last comparison um, for myocarditis, pericarditis and MISC after infection, we divided by the incidence of pericarditis or myocarditis after vaccination. We found that the risk for cardiac complications was significantly higher after infection than vaccination for both males and females in all age groups. Next slide, please. This slide displays the risk ratios for cardiac complications after infection versus vaccination among males aged 12 to 17 and 18 to 29. To varying magnitudes across all conditions, follow-up periods and age groups, the risk for cardiac complications is higher among patients with a SARS-CoV-2 infection versus vaccination. Next slide, please. I'll now pivot to discussing two publications currently under review both investigating PASC disparities amongst hospitalized and non-hospitalized adult patients in New York City. These analyses were conducted within the Insight Network as the vanguard site for the PCORNET adult EHR cohort and will be replicated across all PCORNET recover sites. Next slide, please. Across both studies, our objective was to understand if the risk of incident PASC conditions differ by patient race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status among SARS-CoV-2 positive patients. Similar to what Renu described, we developed a list of 137 possible PASC diagnostic categories, and then we identified the top 10 conditions with the largest difference in incidence between COVID positive and negative patients. We performed adjusted logistic regression comparing for baseline demographics, comorbidities, year month of positive test or diagnosis. We defined positive and negative patients um, by a PCR or antigen test or by a COVID-19 diagnosis between March of 2020, October of 2021. Patients were grouped by non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black and Hispanic. We used a patient's zip code tabulation area as a proxy for socioeconomic status category, categorized into five quintiles based on income. So it's area level socioeconomic status. And we made comparisons between the highest 
and the lowest quintiles. The next two slides display the results. Next slide, please. This slide displays racial and ethnic disparities comparing black and Hispanic patients versus white patients. Racial and ethnic disparities existed in both hospitalized and non-hospitalized patients and in certain PASC conditions. Disparities in respiratory signs and symptoms, chest pain and headache existed amongst both hospitalized and non-hospitalized groups. Next slide, please. This slide displays so socioeconomic disparities comparing low income quintiles versus the highest income quintile. Income based disparities were not evident amongst hospitalized patient, but patients, but present overall and for specific conditions amongst non hospitalized patients, like chest pain, musculoskeletal pain, lower respiratory disease, and headache, migraine. Next slide. I'll now transition to juxtapose, juxtapose the study results just presented with the concept of queries, a less sophisticated but valuable method of inquiry and hypothesis generation. Queries account for patients in a database who meet certain specified characteristics. They often stratify patients by demographics and other clinical parameters so that trends in patients with different characteristics can be observed and they're designed to provide data-driven evidence to support hypothesis generation for specific studies. They are different than an analysis in that an analysis is the output of a more sophisticated set of queries. For example, exploring the differences in outcomes due to baseline characteristics in two groups. What we presented previously was the results of more sophisticated analyses, but as an example of queries that the clinical, the EHR-based cohorts can support. Next slide, please. What is PASC? How many people have PASC? How many people have the PASC subphenotype? What is the mortality rate of people who have PASC? Are patients with certain conditions more susceptible to certain types of PASC? Next slide, please. I'm going to conclude um, by summarizing the arc of work and offering ways in which the EHR cohorts can be of assistance to the clinical cohorts. First, we're generating important evidence to detect, predict, treat, and prevent PASC. We're utilizing two different machine, two different scientific approaches, machine learning and health services research. Queries are an important tool to allow us to determine trends and generate hypotheses. And we stand ready to support the clinical cohorts to run queries, dive deeper into research of, of results of studies beyond published results, develop and implement and evolve computable phenotypes and support the execution of clinical trials. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll now share my screen or try, thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm Chris Shute. I'm one of the co-leads of, of the N3C and happy to uh, share this with you today. Uh, this is just to remind you of what uh, Emily's uh, work earlier that was described by Melissa on identifying uh, COVID patients uh, using a machine learning approach that was published last week. That was the basis for some of these slides. This is, if you will, uh, a geographic characterization of PASC, at least in the N3C consortium where you can see a magnitude of counts uh, for those participating sites. These are not full population denominators. We understand that, uh, but they do give a sense of the distribution of the disease across the country. And of course, then the relative fraction of patients within the contributing sites uh, by intensity uh, across the country. And we have a few sites for whom we don't have enough qualifying patients to uh, make that determination. Uh, this was a slide presented uh, earlier last month by Atel Bennett, uh, showing, if you will, the, the incidence of uh, the percent of patients with PASC in our cohort uh, that have been hospitalized. And you can see there's actually a, a, a modest spike associated with Delta, 
uh, compared to those patients who were outpatient, not inpatient, but a, a smaller incidence rate, but nevertheless, uh, also with that corresponding spike. Among children, we see that over time from early July to January, these are the proportion of, of children by age group uh, that the children with PASC are getting younger, uh, that these younger age groups are having increasing frequency. And then the absolute count, this is the scale on the, on the right, uh, was uh, uh, showing a, a bump in the Delta and a very large bump in the Omicron space uh, more recently. Uh, these are markers of post-infection trajectories. This happens to be serum creatinine. Uh, we're comparing PASC and non-PASC. Uh, they're actually statistically significant because there are so many patients, uh, but uh, they're, they're obviously significantly overlapping. Uh, and this contrast uh, not hospitalized with, with hospitalized where it's actually less significant. Um, again, ferritin measures appear to show in PASC patients in red, a bit of a higher shoulder and then a lag among non-hospitalized patients, and perhaps an even higher shoulder uh, and a longer lag among hospitalized patients with more clear distinction of these overlaps and their, uh, their range of, of value. Uh, for uh, lymphopenia, uh, we're seeing a, a much stronger signal uh, of uh, greater lymphopenia among uh, non-hospitalized past patients and a less strong, but nevertheless uh, notable uh, pattern of lymphopenia among uh, past patients who have been hospitalized. Uh, this is the survival question of hospitalized versus non-hospitalized patients who have PASC. Uh, and you can see, not surprisingly, that not hospitalized patients have a longer survival uh, than hospitalized patients, a greater mortality associated with uh, patients who endured hospitalization uh, and subsequently uh, had PASC. Uh, however, there is a paradox in this data. This is something Richard Moffat has pointed out uh, that for many of the persons we lose to follow up, and that is we cannot make a prediction. Uh, and those persons appear to have uh, less mortality, uh, partly and due to their being lost to follow up and not being able to know the outcomes. Uh, and then at the other extreme for hospitalized patients, we actually lose patients to death uh, where they die and therefore have uh, a, a greater, so we're not able to make a prediction whether they have PASC or not because they die before we can do so um, and have enough data on that question. Uh, and uh, the, this uh, otherwise represents the uh, patients with PASC and not PASC. Uh, we did look at risk factors uh, for PASC uh, in, in these data. Uh, one of the queries we were asked, we were asked to look explicitly at apnea, sclerosis, diabetes mellitus, and obesity. You can see there's strong univariate, well, reasonably strong risks of these conditions uh, associated with that that subsequently develop a PASC. Uh, and after adjustment, they still remain uh, in the 50 to 60% increased risk range uh, per persons with apnea having a 60% increased risk of generating uh, or experiencing PASC. Um, for diabetes, uh, less compelling uh, and obesity, uh, not as strong either. Uh, we obviously, the key question is around vaccination. Uh, and we are in the process of rigorously exploring what impact does vaccination have on PASC. We used historically uh, what we call the historical control, looking at patients before any vaccinations were available, and then the post-vaccination period. Uh, and we're using, again, uh, the, uh, in our current analytics, uh, the more detailed information associated with state registries. These are the vaccination profiles of the sites that contribute data, the 73 sites that contribute data to uh, N3C. And you can see we have what appears to be fairly complete coverage of vaccination. And we know that many of these sites are linked to their state registries. And we have other sites, which not surprisingly uh, have lower reported vaccination. This is probably a misclassification of their vaccination status. So before we pursue this aggressively, we are seeking to increase the number of linkages we have with state registries for these sites so that we have a more complete ascertainment of vaccination status pertinently that we can with confidence say that a patient has not had a vaccination. That's an important statement to understand.
Uh, so in overall, uh, we have the characterization of PASC with trends over time, geographic distributions, uh, biomarkers, mortality rates, comorbidities, and vaccination. There were a few questions that came up before uh, the environment. I have three minutes left, so I should be able to at least address some of them. Uh, one of them was what, treat what, what treatments are being used uh, for patients with PASC. And this looks at common medications, you can see that there's a, a larger percentage of respiratory drug systems. That's not terribly surprising. Uh, Anti-infectives as well. Um, and arguably uh, cardiovascular and, and nervous system drug categories are perhaps overrepresented uh, compared to some of these other uh, agents that are used. Not definitive, uh, but uh, it's suggesting at least patterns of treatment for persons with PASC this, in this case, defined with the U09.9 um, uh, characterization of PASC rather than our inferenced PASC uh, uh, characterizations. Now, the other question uh, or another mode of understanding what, what happens to these patients are procedures that they experience. Um, obviously, there are diagnostic procedures and imaging procedures. That's not terribly surprising. But again, consistent with cardiovascular findings that have been previously reported by both groups, uh, we see a, 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 a sizable incidence of at least diagnostic tests associated with ECG and echo um, that is, is out of proportion to some other uh, tests that are used. Pulmonary tests, of course, are, are not terribly surprising uh, in this particular context. One of the questions was around uh, uh, metabolism and, and whether weight or diabetes has, has a, a question with this. And this again is from a manuscript in review where it was demonstrated that uh, for the control patients, all patients with diabetes and the COVID-19 patients, there was really no significant uh, difference in uh, hemoglobin A1C or weights uh, after uh, uh, contracting COVID. So in terms of contributing, uh, having a metabolic profile that would contribute to this that does not, at least at a surface level, appear to be a, a high risk element. Uh, and with that, I do wanna make the point uh, that N3C, as I think all of these communities are, are really a village um, and that the communities that have contributed to this have been extraordinary, not only in terms of, of data provisioning, but the communities that have come together for analytics and uh, optimization of the efforts that we are sharing. And with that, I will stop and we can begin questions. Thank you all so much. This is, um, I, I've, it sparks a thousand thoughts and a thousand uh, ideas every time I hear you all uh, present this work. So thank you. Um, You've done a great job of addressing um, some of the questions and, and that have come in uh, both beforehand and during, and I really appreciate that. Um, in thinking, I, it, there are always a few um, a few things that come up for me, and and uh, I'll lead off just to make sure we have enough time for this with a question that um, is is partly question, partly I guess public service announcement, and it has to do with um, how how we think about um, big data, particularly electronic health record and real world data um, contributions to a bigger scientific effort, um, like the Recover Initiative or like any other initiative that incorporates uh, a, a component like this. Um, the kind of science that you all are doing, I think, has some really unique aspects to it, and I think both groups have done a really fine job of of highlighting some of those. Um, I, I, speaking from, from my own uh, sort of learning about all of this, I, I know that I sometimes find myself challenged to, to remember, to remind myself that um, some of these unique aspects need to, I, I have to keep them at the front of my mind. And, and I'm thinking about things like, um, you know, these, these data assets that you all are building on and, and, and interrogating to discover uh, key things about um, PASC or long COVID, um, they change all the time. They grow on a weekly basis. Um, and so uh, what we, you know, what we know today um, may and probably will evolve over some period of time. And I think a lot of us have seen that that, that 
period of time can be compressed um, with regard to the pandemic. And that's not just true for acute COVID. I think that's true for long COVID as well, or, or for PASC as well. Um, learning that, that computable phenotypes and machine learning models um, probably do need to change over time and to be updated with, um, with new knowledge as we acquire it. Um, and so I, I think what I've learned is that um, that's a strength of the kind of science that you all do. That's, that I, I've come to think of that um, as not a limitation, but a strength. So, so the question slash public service announcement here is for, for anybody else who might um, be challenged to keep these things at the front of mind, to, to remember that there's not like an answer and we're done and moving on. Do you all have some tips, pointers, tricks, hints um, to help the, the person receiving this knowledge that you're generating to stay aware of and oriented to what are truly unique strengths? Well, you're really talking about the intrinsic nature of observational data as opposed to prospective cohort data. And both are hugely complementary. Uh, we experienced early in the N3C environment, I'm sure Picornet had the same experiences, where the darn codes just didn't exist for a lot of things we wanted to capture, like vaccinations, uh, specific uh, mRNA vaccinations that we, we had to invent codes and use them on a temporary basis. Uh, so that, that begs the question, well, are there things that are occurring that are not yet coded that we're not even aware of? Uh, and, and how do we capture those and how do we retroactively capture those? The other major challenge is we are always uh, really fraught with this problem of missing information. I think the vaccination data that I showed is, is a poster child example of that. We know we have missing information in, in those uh, for some sites on vaccination status. So we, we have profound misclassification, I mean, let's admit it, uh, on, on for some of those sites. As that data improves, then the picture becomes more and more clear, more and more compelling, more and more robust. Again, with observational data, it still may be biased. It doesn't mean it's absolutely right. Uh, and then we have the challenge of, of, of looking for undiscovered or unrecognized biases so that we can, to the extent practical, uh, account for them and adjust for them. And it's an ongoing continuous process. Um, but I think we still have robust findings that have stood the test of time so far. Uh, Thomas? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Go, go ahead, Tom. Um, I'll, I'll kick it over to you in, in a second, Randy, just respond to a couple of, to, to Josh's question and a couple of things from, from Chris. Um, agree on, on the, the arc and the connection and the, and, and the role in contribution of observational research into the arc of knowledge generation. Um, what, what we're seeing is, is science you know, in, in, in real time um, as codes come into play, as data evolves, vaccine registries become linked, computable phenotypes are developed and validated you know, on charts, at sites. One thing that came up earlier that that Chris alluded to is this, and Rachel brought it up first, is this concept of testing trajectory and COVID positivity and how we're defining COVID positive patients just in general, right? At first, it was only a diagnostic code. Then the, 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 the um, lab results that Chris mentioned were mapped and were queryable and were usable. Then testing went into the home. And we're now back to considering diagnostic codes as part of our case definition, where we made that decision not to include the diagnostic codes at certain periods of the pandemic previously. So it goes through sort of the arc of decision making, the way that, um, that these decisions change and evolve over time. Um, and Josh, I think you alluded to an important point as to how do we message that to a you know, scientific community or community writ large that this is just the arc of the work. Um, and this, this, these discoveries are, are happening and definitions are, are changing regularly. Renu? Yeah, I, I think it's a fabulous question, Josh. And I, I certainly would echo both what Tom and, and Chris have shared. And I, I, I think I would add one more thing, which is I think of 
data science at scale, which this certainly is with, you know, millions and millions of patients being studied across both initiatives as a very powerful tool to understand what is happening at a population level, whereas clinical trials and our clinical cohorts for recover are able to derive more evidence at the individual level. Um, and I think that that's also helpful because I see our work as helping to start to characterize this diverse set of conditions, start to lay out the large scale epidemiology, start to develop putative risk factors, putative uh, treatment modalities, um, and, and very much in partnerships with our clinical cohorts that can then take some of these early findings and dive very, very deep. Excellent, I think that's really helpful. And um, uh, yeah, I think that complementary nature is, is really important. We are, we probably have time for one more question. Um, and I'm gonna pull one up uh, from the, um, Q and A. Oh nope, I'm getting the message actually that we need to go ahead and wrap up. So uh, we capture everything in the Q and A. Um, we could probably carry this conversation and this discussion on for another hour if if we had it. Um, and and I think that speaks to the the um, the impact that you all are having and and the importance of the work that you're doing. So so thank you so much. Um, I am going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up, turn it over to Dr. Hatcher to take us home and once again say thank you to everyone who participated today. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fessel. Thank you to all of our speakers um, for the wonderful presentations and very interesting discussion. Um, just to wrap things up, um, I want to also thank our audience for attending and engaging with the Q&A. Um, as a reminder, a recording of today's webinar will be available on recovercovid.org within a few weeks. We will also be posting a Q&A document that, has that will have responses to many of the questions we've received today, including those we did not have time to address. Now this slide um, lists the topics for future sessions and our three seminars are held on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month from 12 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. We have some exciting topics coming up and we hope to see you at future sessions. Thank you and have a great day.